Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Eccentric Circles Short Stories Volume 1, edited by Cynthia Brackett Vincent. So this is a short story collection by Encircle Publication. They are the publishing house that publishes my uh, Lightfold series of detective novels, which includes Driven, The Tower Hill Terror, and coming soon, uh, The Lightfold Files. I have a story in this called The Adventure... Wait, The Mis... The Mi I know my stories, I promise. It's the mystery of the missing gnome, is it? The case of the missing gnome, that's the one. Got it in the end. Um, so yeah, I've got a story in there that's gonna be in the Lightfall Files later on, and there are a bunch of other authors as well. Uh, so I'm gonna review this, but bear in mind, obviously I'm gonna be slightly biased. Um, I'm not reviewing my own story as well, I'm leaving that to you to make your minds upon, but I have made some tabs. So as always, I'm gonna read you the blurb, I'm gonna check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. Dane reads. In Circle Publications is proud to present Eccentric Circles Short Stories Volume 1, edited by Cynthia Brackett Vincent. This eclectic collection of short stories features various genres, all penned by the authors of Encircle Publications. Their novels represent mysteries, thrillers, literary fiction, humour, historical fiction, romance and more. We are very proud of our amazing authors and their work, and now Encircle has brought their short fiction together, amounting to 25 stories, for readers to explore and enjoy. Featured authors Sue Baumgardner, Mike Beffler, Richard J. Cass, Dane Cobain, Matt Cost, Sharon L. Dean, Catherine Diltz, Bruna Gomez, Vaughan C. Hardacker, Joe Kilgore, J.K. Naus, Scott Lipanovich, B.J. Magnani, Esley Manning, Alison L. McLennan, Anne Britting Ollison, Sarah Lynn Richard, J. Rudd, Lois Schmidt, C.B. Shanahan, Kevin St. Jar, Karen Hansen Stuck, A.G. Tibble, and Lara Tupper. So we're just going to go straight on in. I'm going to start with American Justice by Sharon L. Dean. So this is about some people who are sitting on jury duty. And um, somebody says here, well, Beside me, Susan crochets a baby sweater in a colour as neutral as the courtroom walls, except for the threads of pink that announce the baby as a girl. Expecting a granddaughter, I whisper. June next month. I'd rather be knitting, but knitting needles are banned. Hard to imagine anyone using them as a weapon in here. And I just like that little detail, and I'm sure it's true as well. I can imagine they would be banned. And then we get this line, which I enjoy as an Agatha Christie fan. So it says, I look at the clock, fearing that the case of Shaw versus Plant won't come to as neat a conclusion as the plot of an Agatha Christie novel. So we've got here uh, The Bank Robber by Vaughan C. Hardacker. Um, the, one of the characters in this is called Dylan Thomas. Like the poet? Yes. The stranger looked exasperated. You have no idea how many times a day I have to answer that question. I once went to school with a kid called uh, Michael Jackson. We also get this little bit of dialogue on the same page. Do you know a writer named Robert Lyle? I don't think I've heard of him, so I don't think that he ever wrote anything of significance. Thomas smiled. Unfortunately, that holds true for most writers. And uh, then we jump back to nine years ago and we get Robert Lyle. He's, uh, he, was, he was so broke that if air cost a nickel, he'd suffocate, which I think is a great line. It's an American line, obviously. I guess we'd have if air cost a... We don't really have a slang term for any coins. If, if air cost 20p, you'd suffocate or something. And we also get a reference to Rosemary's Baby in this, which I thought was cool because I've just read Rosemary's Baby like a couple of weeks ago. So then on to Baptism by Kevin St. Jar. It's actually a very short story, so I didn't, I didn't make any notes for that. So then we'll move on to The Burns Family by A.J. Tibbolt. Tibbolt? Tibbolt? We have a character in this who's very disappointed uh, because he has a daughter instead of a son. Which, I don't like people like that. Then we have The Case of the Missing Gnome by Dane Cobain. I didn't tab anything out because obviously it's my own story, can't really review it. Then on to The Cat's Clue by Lois Schmidt. And this stuff, this is funny. So my cat, uh, Biggie, he's got some Maine Coon in him as well. But yeah, the, literally, the o Biggie, literally the opening of this story is, you need to give Magnus eardrops twice a day for a week, I said. My best friend, Samantha, a.k.a. Sam, stared at me in horror. Abby, she said to me, do you know how difficult it is to put drops in a cat's ear? Of course I knew, I was a veterinarian. And the fact that Magnus was a 20 pound Maine Coon cat added to the difficulty. A funny line here as well. Uh, what about your cousins? They know nothing about horses. They couldn't tell a stallion from a mare. She grinned. Well, they probably could tell that, but you get the point. I <laughs> like this as well, she's eating dinner. So she sits down <laughs> with her husband or a partner uh, her fiance, there we go, Jason, who's an attorney. So I set the table and poured two glasses of white wine. Once we sat down and began eating, Jason said, the autopsy on Carol Judd is finished. I'm just like, bloody hell, you know how to pick a dinner conversation, don't you, Jason? We get a reference to one of the, one of the suspects writing an article about the poisons that Agatha Christie used in her books. And they go to a pub called The Hedge and the Hog, which I thought was a fun name. 
we get a little spelling mistake in this. I drove past one of the big box stores and it's past as in, you know, P-A-S-S-E-D rather than past as in P-A-S-T. On to Choices by S. Lee Manning. This was a very coffee drinker thing to, to say. And um, this reminds me of myself because I've been kind of trying to limit my coffee because of my anxiety. I sometimes get heart palpitations and stuff. Um, she wiped her face as Collier fixed her a cup of black coffee with sugar, her favorite. Even though it sometimes made her sick, she still wanted it. Um, we get a reference uh, to lanyap, uh, the Creole term for something extra given during a business transaction. Just a very cool word choice. Should have put that in my own book, The Lexicologist Handbook. We get a weird error in um, this as well. So it's the word your, but instead of an apostrophe, it's a semicolon breaking up the U and the RE. And we get this bit where this guy basically says he's gonna quit his job on Monday um, and he's gonna start working for the gangster on Tuesday. And it's like, don't, People normally have to serve out a notice period in America. They definitely do here. I did. Multiple times. Fucking hated serving out the notice period. Everyone knows you're going and you're just there like a spare part. Okay, and then on to Catherine Dilt's Cindy's Storm. So this one's all about um, basically a couple cele celebrating their anniversary and then and they go hunting and the wife's not too happy about it. And then we move on to The Day of Reckoning by Karen Hansen Stuck. Uh, no notes on that either. And then we've got Go Fish by Lara Tupper. And this has got a reference to the woman works in a library and she says, Inside no one noticed her display on smelting. They exchanged one Stephen King for another and left. At least they've got good taste. And we get this as well, another reference to Stephen King. Could there be a dead body in the woods, no one claims, Larry asked in a writing workshop. Or a woman go and gets pregnant. The landlady. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it Gogan? I don't know. Paul. Maybe, said Eddie. She'd have the baby, then keep it locked up in the attic. She grinned. Why would she do that, said June. It's Maine, Edie said. Stephen King. And I think the fun thing about that as well is that Encircle publications are based in Maine as well. Then we have Jennifer Jacobson, Private Eyeball by Mike Beffler. Just quite a fun little story about a kid who becomes a private investigator. Lady of Baraba by J.K. Gnaus. Um, this is like historical fiction. Then B.J. Magnani, Lily Robinson, and an abbreviated mission. Uh, Lily Robinson being her like well-known detective as part of her series. Oh yeah, and then she's having a debriefing because there's an ass assassinations happened, and the guy's French. Um, and so we get Robinson. I can see the sting in your eyes, mate. This was necessary. The dark-haired man says in his smooth French accent. How did you do it? I could not see. I let out a sigh. The guilt like a boomerang returns to my chest. I like healing better than killing. That was the idea. Make it seamless, I say dispassionately. Seal to play, explain. And so the reason I tab that is because in that situation they would have used formal French. They would have used s'il vous play. Uh, seal to play is what you would say if you were hanging out with your mates, not if you were in a meeting with a hired killer. Um, Matt Cost, mainly trap. So this is about uh, a murder at a, uh, there's like a murder mystery evening kind of thing. And we get this, which is very cool because it's a little, uh, you know, in reference, self-reference. You own that mystery bookstore down in Brunswick, don't you, Bailey asked. We stopped in there a while back, but the only guy in there was this crusty old fellow. Got a few good mysteries. Took two off your Encircled publication shelf. Didn't even know Maine had a quality publisher like that. Nicely done, Matt. Then we have Scott Lipanovich with Moonlight. Didn't have anything there. Mother's Day by Sarah Lynn Richard. Nothing there. Then we have Jay Rudd, Nuns Fret Not. And in this, like, we have Friar Tuck knocking about. And I believe I tabbed something towards the end as well. Because uh, there are basically some lesbian nuns in it. And so we just get this entertaining little bit of dialogue here. Uh, Perhaps not, but surely you were lusting in your heart, Tuck decided, feeling he was on shore or ground here. Lusting? For what am I lusting, do you imagine? For, for tree fornication. I expect that as you fondle one another, you are thinking about tree fornication, and that is what creates the excitement that leads to those cries you describe. Tuck really wasn't sure where he was going with this. How did he know what was in the minds of women? And how serious was this as a sin? Tuck regularly turned a blind eye toward Little John's relationship with Will Stutely, because he saw no harm in it, though the penitentials prescribed ten years of penance for that particular sin, and only three for this one. Didn't that make this more of a venial sin, if sin it was? Fornication. So you suggest that I am imagining being penetrated by a man while being stroked by my friend, the young woman demanded. Indeed, Tuck nodded. Of what else would you be thinking? Sister Mary Eusebia bowed her head to hide a smirk. I assure you, Brother Friar, before God I swear to you, lying with a man is the furthest thing from my mind at such moments. Then we have Old Friends and Zip Drives by C.B. Shanahan. 
Uh, that was quite good, but I didn't have anything out of it. That one was like, uh, it's got a bit of a Silicon Valley twist to it. Uh, Sue Baumgartner, Patsy of Harlan County. This is set in the 30s and 40s, and I believe it ends in 1950. So there's a reference to the Grand Ole Opry of getting into full swing, and uh, I'm fascinated by the Grand Ole Opry, because we don't really have a, an equivalent in the UK. And um, it's basically like a US institution for like country music. Alison L. McLennan, Sisters of Grace and Mud. Cracking line in this. I mean, it's a bit harsh, but women, they cry like dogs piss. Okay. Uh, the Terrace Saint Tropez by Bruna Gomez. So we just get this line it was important to them. Everything in France is important. Of course, in Australia, maybe not so much. And then we have Ulnar Splint by Anne Britting Ollison. And then Waiting for the 1215 by Joe Kilgore. And this has got a cracking opening paragraph here. So six o'clock. The way I see it, morning's not really morning till that first cup of coffee's in your hand. When that hot black brew slides across your tongue, well, it seems to me it fires your soul as well as your gullet, assuming you have a soul. Reverend Ogilvy tells me everybody has one, but I have my doubts. Too long in the job, I guess. Seen too many things I'd give a broodmare not to remember, but for whatever reason, simply can't find a way to forget. Heard it said there are some people who actually don't drink coffee. Not sure I believe that. But if there are some of that persuasion, I don't think I'd trust them. Of course, there are a lot of people I don't trust for one reason or another. Don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those, what do they call them? Oh yeah, one of those misanthropes you hear about now and then. It's just that doubt and mistrust are load-bearing occupational hazards when it comes to being Sheriff of Concho County. And he's basically waiting for somebody to come out of jail who's sworn to get his revenge. It's like a Western story. There's a great line, Nature can produce some strange things alright, and there's no doubt that Goldworthy is one of the strangest. Goldworthy being the antagonist. And then we have What's Your Name by Richard J. Cass, followed by the About the Authors. Um, nothing else to tab or to mention because I didn't have anything else out there. But yeah, overall, I really enjoyed this collection. I thought it was a nice little variety. It does lean a little heavily towards, um, you know, crime and murder mysteries. But that's one of Encircle Publications' specialism, so you, you know, can't really fault it for that. Plus, my own story was a crime slash mystery story, so I'd be a bit of a hypocrite if I complained about it. But overall, did enjoy. Pretty solid four out of five. Um, really, pretty, pretty proud to be a part of this one. So, would recommend check it out. So there we have it. That's what I made of Eccentric Circles Short Stories Volume One by Encircle Publications. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot.